For nearly a thousand years, there has been a castle at Pembroke. Norman Baron Roger de Montgomery knew this place was the key to holding West Wales. The power vacuum created by the death of Rhys Ap Tudor, King of West Wales, was the opportunity de Montgomery had been waiting for. The ambitious Baron marched from Shrewsbury, struck across the country spine and seized Pembroke as his base. Its defensible limestone headland commanded the Clethi estuary. Beneath it, the Wogan Cavern offered a natural cold store and shelter, just as it had to Stone Age settlers 11,000 years before. Here, de Montgomery built his home, a fortress of timber. King Henry I founded the town, which sprang up where the castle's outer ward now stands. Henry's nephew, King Stephen, gave this land to Gilbert de Clare, known as Strongbow, and made him Earl of Pembroke. Gilbert's son Richard, also called Strongbow, raised the castle's first stone building, the Norman Hall, still standing today. In 1170, he sailed from Pembroke with 1,200 troops to invade Ireland. He was successful enough to make Henry II nervous of his growing power. The king sailed from Pembroke to rein in his warlord and granted him enough titles to satisfy his ambition. William Marshall, England's greatest knight, a statesman and friend of kings, married Strongbow's daughter and heiress, Isabel, becoming Earl of Pembroke in 1199. He rebuilt the inner ward in stone, tripled the size of the castle with storehouses in the outer bailey, added the great keep, five floors of military might. The floorboards are long gone. But from the top of the tower, you can still see the lands that Marshall held. It was William de Valence, husband of Marshall's granddaughter Joan, who began to create the castle we know today. With its towered stone outer wall. Stout gatehouse. Private apartments and a luxurious new great hall. There was a treasury, a courthouse, and a dungeon too. In fact, everything the castle needed as a seat of regional government, which is all that Pembroke might have remained. But jump forward 150 years, and a Welsh nobleman called Jasper Tudor brought his brother's young widow, Margaret Beaufort, to the castle to give birth to her only child, a boy called Henry. The Wars of the Roses drove Jasper and the 14-year-old Henry into exile. They took ship from Temby to Brittany, but as an adult, Henry returned to the Clethi and marched into England, raising an army of 5,000 men as he went. His victory over Richard III at Bosworth Field saw him crowned King Henry VII, founder of the Tudor dynasty, 
all of Welsh blood. Pembroke had changed British history, and would again. In the First Civil War, Pembroke was Parliament's only Welsh stronghold. But at the end of the fighting, the garrison, angry that their wages had not been paid, defected to the king, sparking a second war. Oliver Cromwell laid siege to Pembroke with 6,000 men. The castle and town held him off for eight long weeks. But the arrival of the great siege guns broke their resistance. Pembroke surrendered. Cromwell ordered the towers destroyed, finally putting an end to Pembroke's fighting days. 200 years of neglect by its owners, the Price family of Gogerdan, left the castle a ruin, ignored by all except romantic painters and locals plundering the stone for building. In the 19th century, though, J.R. Cobb restored part of the castle. And then local landowner, Major General Sir Ivor Phillips, bought the property and carried on the restoration. His daughter, Mrs. Basil Ramsden, put the castle into a trust administered by members of her family and representatives of the town. Today, the Castle Trust continues to maintain, explain, and to share the castle with visitors. Stone Age cave dwelling to Norman fortress, from the birth of a king to ruin and restoration, Pembroke Castle's long history is waiting for you. We hope you enjoy your visit.